Hi, I'm Ryan Jinx, and welcome to Jinx Painting. We are going to talk about the fact that I don't YouTube all the time today. Um, so, I am at a job site right now, and uh, Bobby, who helps me with Bolt Busters, uh, came down and doesn't normally help me paint, but today he is helping us scrape this house, and um yeah so it is 6 a.m in california we are starting here super early but anyways i am in my customer's backyard it's a beautiful backyard with wi-fi and so it works out um i am 36 years old i have been painting my whole life family business and I live in Lodi, pretty much right in the middle of California, about two and a half hours away from Yosemite. So that's why Yosemite has been a huge culture um, shaper in my life, including, um, I don't know, something that really inspired me for highlining because it did technically start there. And so, um, yeah, I have done the YouTube thing for about four years and um, I was I was planning on doing it for only five years I, I did have an intentional five-year goal but um, I mean once you have that many subscribers I'll have a lot more subscribers in a year I'm like why would I stop so ah, it's an addiction I guess but um, yeah I have two cats puff and tough I live by myself I am basically single and have no kids which really does allow a lot of time to run the painting business the Juno coffee business that I promote in a lot of my videos and the YouTube thing I have put out over well over 200 videos now on YouTube and uh, another 80 on Highline University and it's <laughs> this is what we're going to talk about in this video today is just kind of like how um, how I'm able to manage all that and why I do it and the end goal so it's a little bit more casual of a video in my book because usually I am a little bit more wound up and more exciting and animated so you're not bored <laughs> so, but it's also six in the morning um, so let's see here let's start Let's start at the beginning. I was 19 years old and heard Yosemite and how much being at the top of the cliffs really like gave me that gut-wrenching experience and vertigo and I really liked liked it. And so I learned how to backpack and that was a learning curve. Didn't know anything, really suffer fested. And at, let's see here, 19 like 21 22 um i was only climbing for about a year and i was watching dean potter videos at that time and there was just no no part of the videos that showed the anchors so it was pretty hard to reverse engineer how to set up a high line um i did not know what a web lock was um, this is while this is still while Jerry Mischewski was playing video games before he even highlined. So like a lot of the stuff that came out uh, came out from him. Uh, that's where I learned a lot. And he hasn't even started at this point yet in 2006, I believe, 2005. And so I kind of just hack jobbed it and used climbing anchor technology or systems. And I rigged my first highline in 2006 and sucked. And I sucked so bad that I didn't really set up another Highline for four years because I realized I didn't know what I was doing. So I spent a lot of time in the park figuring it out and until I felt comfortable to go up high. Um, yeah, it was my second, 22nd birthday that I almost died on a Highline in 2006. Um, and so climbing was a huge aspect of my life. 2008, three years after I started, I finally climbed El Capitan. 2006, I climbed my first big wall. I got into climbing specifically to learn how to climb El Capitan. So I always have these big goals in mind when I start something. And 
everything I do is working up to it. And at the end of this video, I'll explain to you what my big goal in highlighting is. As you might be able to tell, especially after I say it, why I uh, focus on certain things on the channel. So, um, as far as YouTube goes, I started that in 2016 because I felt like somebody needed to make some tutorial videos on how to set up a highline. Like no one was touching that with a 10 foot pole. Uh, maybe because only gear companies were actually putting out educational material and they maybe just didn't want the liability. So I thought saying how not to highline was my way of not having liability. Not sure if that works, but that I do regret not putting a K in front of the knot because that also would have been funny. So anyways, I was only going to put out 10 videos. A little backstory it might be a little bit more funny is I was just practicing on YouTube making highlining videos because I, for the six months before, I was uh, addicted three hours a day, couldn't wait to get home, addicted, shaking if I couldn't get to it watching atheist videos on YouTube. I was a hardcore Christian. I went to church twice a week. I gave away enough money to buy a house. I was gonna be an underground missionary in Pakistan. <sighs> Cause doesn't everybody just need to be westernized? <laughs> Anyways, um, so once I started finding these atheist YouTube videos, it, I mean, if you're a Christian and you're just completely deep in it, like you don't hear the other side, um, I spent a year at the mosque learning Urdu and um, Islam so I could eventually go to Pakistan. And, which would still be cool, but it would be for highlighting. <laughs> and I uh, really, or I wrote a book. I haven't put, put it out, but I wrote an entire like 200 page book about religion as it was my journal of what I was learning. And so um, that was when I started this YouTube channel about highlining because I wanted to make about 10 videos and get kind of good in 10 videos as if that's possible, good at making YouTube videos so I can make a, my own atheist YouTube channel. So almost 300 videos later. <laughs> um, so basically in order to make myself happy about the fact that I never did do the atheist thing we made the church of slack life which was super interesting social experiment um basically i uh with kim wiglin when we were together we made the church of slack life and it was interesting because it really pissed off almost every european americans were like 50 50 on whether or not they thought it was funny and brazilians made a cult out of it and like it was just interesting how the different areas of the world really embraced this social experiment, um, which we've like closed the church of Slack Life. It was a legitimate religion. It was uh, filed with the state and everything. And uh, it wasn't a church, it was a religion. And it was it was fascinating. Um, whoever didn't hear about the channel before then heard about it through uh, negative marketing, but hey, that's how Trump become pre became president. So, you know, learned something there. Um, and then, yeah, so, I never did do the atheist channel. I realized that's just a bunch of bitter people, nothing but trolls, not worth your time. Um, if somebody wants to know something, you just talk to them. And I'm pretty open-minded. And the journey to leave, go from being a Christian to not was pretty gnarly. So I don't wish that upon anybody if it's not completely worth it to them, especially older people. There's just no reason to like, change 60 years of your mindset for something that's if you know if it's not killing you just don't fix it but um you know this is gonna be on youtube but i don't care um since doing psychedelics for the last year i did basically no drugs before 35 but i've done psychedelics in the last year and um yeah i can totally see the value of a spiritual life i just don't think it's you know some big guy in the sky that we're all codependent on his feelings and who needs his ego stroked all the time. So there, there's that. Sorry if you're a Christian. Um, anyways, so in 2016, I had already had my gear wall in my garage. So I thought, oh, that'd be a cool place to film. 
but the audio was awful. I had to film between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. in order to get the light to reflect off my car so it wasn't so dark when I was filming. I had no lights, no mics, no nothing. Uh, I may have had a mic camera, but that was like eight feet away, right? So the echo was just awful. I would film one sentence at a time because I was nervous. I didn't have any self-confidence. I didn't know what I was talking about other than um, the little bit I did know. So that's why I thought I could do it all in 10 videos because that would summarize everything I know. Well now, it's gonna take a thousand pages of Highline University and probably 200 more videos to write down the things I have learned because as you put information out there, information comes back and you just become this, this hub of, of knowledge. Plus the knowledge in the sport has also just increased all on its own. And so obviously I keep up with that stuff. Um, anyways, I made, uh, I've been doing it. I've never missed a Wednesday. That was very important to me because it's the, very common when you see people make YouTube videos, they'll put, it's so funny, they'll put out 20 videos in a row and then disappear. I was like, no, I'd rather be consistent. And so sometimes I will have a lot of videos ready to publish and I just won't publish them. I'll do it once a week. And lately I've been doing twice a week, but that has been preventing me from working on the Highline courses, which is actually my focus. And so um, I'm, I might cut back on the twice a week thing, but right now, currently I have um, basically 16 videos ready to hit published on really good stuff. We've tested quad anchors. I've shock loaded high lines. We, I've high lined on one bolt after that. I mean, we've done uh, inline rope jumping. I've established an entire new area in Yosemite I haven't released yet. Um, I mean, just so many cool stuff I'm excited to share, but I've learned consistency, I think is more value. And so I have, I just, I'm always living, uh, my audience is always living eight weeks in the past. I mean, only recently did I put out the wingsuit fly through the net project or the Moab rope jump project. Um, so when I'm really, really stoked about something, it's hard for me to like share that dopamine of likes, look what we did, you know, because it's such old information by the time I share it with everybody. But um, so I have many things in the works that pe people probably won't see for six months. Um, and it's kind of an, it makes me look really consistent, but I'll go through waves of being super busy at work like I am right now. Next week, I'm gonna be working super long um, days out of town, so I won't be doing anything for the channel, which um, in a perfect world, I would work till like 12 or 2 p.m. and then go home and work on the channel until I basically fall asleep. So I work, I can safely say I work eight hours a day on the channel and um, I, I, I paint houses, right? So I, I have to, <laughs> I don't make any money on YouTube. I joke that 200% of your donations go into the channel because I'm still this month, because I put out some really popular videos recently, this month by, might be the first month that I received as much money as I spent, but every other month I've put out um, substantially more money. So it, it cost me around 10,000 on a soft year up to like 20 to 25,000 on, um, on like a bolt busting year. Right. I have almost 10 grand into the bolt system. Slack snap. I ended up just painting the guy's house in order to weld the machine for me. So there was like indirect costs. And, um, so I'll, I try to do stuff as cheap as possible and but like I just forgot to turn off my sprinklers, which bolt busters in the, is in the middle of my yard. I forgot to take off my dynamometer off the cylinder. They're not waterproof. They look waterproof. And that costs $900 to fix. Every time we do a human test with the rock exoticas, because they read 500 times a second, I end up um, breaking them. They're they're kind of fragile, which is really frustrating. But Rock Exotica has been really nice and fixed them for free. But I, I've i bought all the dynamometers I have. Um, uh, Andy Redrick has been great in giving me the discount 
Um, a lot of slot gear companies give me free stuff now. Um, but, I mean, most YouTubers that have over 20,000 subscribers just do stuff for free things, right? That's like if you have 2,000 subscribers on Instagram. It's like, oh, you know, you give me a free shirt, I'll post about it. It's like, no, an episode takes me just coordinating, getting the product, promising somebody something, making a video or two or three, editing it, <laughs> posting it, clickbaiting it, description, promoting it, put it on Instagram, then TikTok, then Facebook. I mean, it's just an enormous amount of work. If people think, oh, well, you got free gear. I'm like, well, I would so much rather buy <laughs> the gear. Um, something I am pretty excited about is the Infinity Ratchet thing that tensions um, long lines or high lines, I guess, uh, from, I think, Equilibrium or Spider makes it. They're like the same company now, so I get... Um, so that's coming in the mail, and that's like an expensive piece of gear that I actually do want. So um, nobody's ever paid me to really make an episode. So, and then I have an editor in India that a um, slackliner in India told me about the guy, and he's been great. His name's Ravi, and he edits probably half, more than half of the videos. And so I spend anywhere from 70 to 100 bucks per episode paying him to edit them. It always takes me a bit of work to send him footage that's in order, obvious on what I want, and having B-roll at the beginning because the first five seconds is super critical. Most things you don't actually hear the videos. Like on Facebook, you'll see the video and you're not gonna turn on the sound unless it's intentional. So I have to put like slow-mo clips or something interesting at the very beginning. And I've become actually a lot more picky than I realized in order to get the videos to be good. And so um, explaining this to somebody who doesn't slackline and has his own style of editing has um, taken a while, but he's done enough videos now that it, he's been really helpful. But it still takes me a lot of work on the back end. I have to watch all of my videos, which like I watch all the videos like twice and it's not that much fun. <laughs> um, I watch everything in double speed. I double check everything in double speeds. So I sound like a rabbit when I talk like this and this is how I edit all my videos. So it's kind of funny. But um, I'll fix different things, re-upload. Oh, my, my cloud just hates me. My internet service provider hates me. My, my upload speeds are so throttled it takes me over an hour to get a video up on the, um, on the YouTube platform which sucks when I have 16 videos I finally thumbnailed and finally wrote descriptions for and want to upload them it's gonna basically take me every afternoon for a week to get them on the internet um, so let's see so back to I don't make money um, I I do on I do have ads at the beginning of the videos and they provide one to two hundred dollars a month and since I've posted a lot of popular videos in the last month, we're talking like a million to 1.2 million views in the last, wow, month. It's just, maybe not a million, uh, a quarter million views in a month. Anyways, I'm at almost 3 million views total. I mean, it's only providing about $300 a month in ads. It, because the topic's not that popular, right? If I was doing um, iPhone reviews um, and they would put YouTube would put iPhone ads at the beginning and then if you clicked on them um, I would get maybe like four cents or five cents per thousand views rather than one cent half my audience is not in America and in America is where you get all the money um, if people in other countries watch your channel there's just there's just no money in it um, but more, more than half my audience is in, in the United States so there's really the advertising money doesn't cover much I feel like there's has been a lot of liability in um, the stunts I've done, and it's a ladder, by the way. Um, stunts and rope jumps and vanette, um, just whatever. Just people helping me, bolts breaking. If something flew and hit somebody in the forehead and killed them, it's just I have no liability protection. So I created How Not to LLC, and uh, that costs money to maintain. I am trying to treat this more like a media company 
instead of just a hobby because everyone views me as a company and so I need to adult even though I just kind of pisses me off because I just am like I'm a dude with a phone making videos like why does this have to be so official and so I um, I recently did that and I did a I did a rigging job in Moab this last March I couldn't post it on my channel because they posted it on their channel and then signing things but we did something super cool we post we built a tough shed on top of a tower I might post a picture later about it who knows um, let's see it reduce cost by the light direct so I I have a lot of requests for different brake tests so much so that I told like 10 people yesterday in emails that I'm a year out from breaking anything not because I have a year of stuff to break but I have like you know probably 50 more samples but I want to highlight my friends told me they want to go to Bear River Reservoir this week and rig a 500 meter and they need my webbing. And I'm like, well, I don't want to freaking sit home while you're all having fun. I want to go to Iceland and see Dottie again and go Highline there. I'm trying to find a balance between basically working too much and putting out consistent quality um, episodes. So um, our, our, our curiosity list is huge. Um, but to answer your UV question, Rafa, we actually have, um, it's the opposite of answering it actually. We have a, somebody donated a rope from the 70s that has been in a cave and muddy and wet for the last 30, 40, I don't know, 40 years, 50 years. How long has it been since the 70s? Holy cow. Anyways, um, we're gonna break test a very old rope and it's gonna be very interesting. Um, so, um, Cat, who's the, oh my gosh, I forgot his name. Who's the guy that does your break test videos or does your break tests? Um, Walter, Walter Siebert. Siebert. Um, his, his why behind um, what he does is that he says ropes don't need to be retired. Um, not for a very long time. That ropes maintain their strength for such a long time and in industrial settings in commercial settings in professional world they're retiring this rope I don't know every year whatever the standard is just so often it's so much waste so much garbage in the landfills and the ropes are fine and he's basically trying to do a thesis on this so it's official right because in that industrial world you need so much testing to prove anything right I do one test and people take it to like as, as a doctrine and it's just to entertain people or to exp explore what the, your options are, right? Um, not Dean's Cave, Rafa, an actual uh, spelunking cave, I think in Tennessee, um, which I actually might get into spelunking, which would be a kind of a fun offshoot of uh, the channels I explore different things because really, highlining is only so much fun. It's nice to explore other things. When I'm done with the Highline courses, I might start skydiving, but I don't think I would base jump. Uh, after base jumping with Andy, I was like, wow, that's a lot of risk for such a short period of fun. But anyways, I, I digress. Um, where was I? I think, yeah, so, oh, I wanna build a drop test tower, um, ideally at my house, because when things are at my house, it's a lot easier to test things. But then if I build a drop test tower, when am I gonna break slack snap stuff? And the bolts, I have so many bolts to break. I still have probably 300 bolts that I have to break um, and a ton of tests. And then once things in my backyard concrete, if they fail in certain ways where the concrete fails, we have to go out in the, like two hours away in the middle of nowhere and test it in granite. I did do 100 break tests in sandstone near the fruit bowl, not at the fruit bowl. And I haven't released a lot of those videos because I figured if enough time goes by, uh, the BLM will not give me too much shit about it. So I will um, eventually start posting the sandstone tests because they're super interesting. Um, but I'm just like on Yosemite's radar and BLM's radar. And I got a letter from the the Department of Interior of Hawaii because we rigged a volcano line and I posted about it 
And so the channel's getting big enough to that it's like, oh, I can't just do whatever I want anymore. I, I, I there's consequences. Like enough people see it. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a t- ticking time bomb in Yosemite because they view me as an official channel, and like I post a lot of videos from there, and you're not supposed to like make money off the park, and I'm like I'm not making money, but I want to make. Um, a series I want to kind of get back into um, big wall uh, big walling and so I want to do a series on big wall glamping and how to sleep on a portal ledge or ledges and be all bougie and take barbecues up there and just kind of make it a fun theme of how uh, comfortable you can be on a big wall because it's funny because it's not comfortable up there and have portal ledge parties and just kind of make fun of this whole fad of in a day speed climbing climbing the nose in less than 24 hours so i've always gone big walling for the camping i never want to do a cap in a day i want to be up there and stay up there especially if all the time and prep it takes i want to be on the big wall and the big wall and clears that i've made has actually distracted me from my end goal on the channel there's so many more climbers that watch this channel at 10,000 views in 24 hours really easily if I do climbing related. But holy cow, if I come up with, you know, or if I like promote the Enov split soft thimble with the extra long backup soft shackle to offset the loops from each other so it's easier to walk over 500 views, maybe a thousand. It's like this super niche special information that highliners need to know and want to know and is neat to be able to promote this segmented technology to accelerate its adoption and but at the same time i don't get the views but i i also have to remember i don't it's it's a number i don't make money from it so like why do i care if i got ten thousand or two thousand as long as a, as long as it's a video that i care about and that my audience cares about and the audience I care about are the people I'm going to see at festivals, people I'm going to meet. Climbers, they'll donate gear. They'll get they'll get behind it. They don't really troll me that hard. Um, Slackliners would troll me the first year or two. I did have about six months of trolling from climbers and then I kind of learned to navigate those trolls and then you're just established enough where people just don't troll you that much. You get the occasional one, but that's just YouTube world. It doesn't matter. Um, it's a bummer. Richard Delaney is also does independently test things and is kind of like what I call the boring version of how not to highline. But he, um, he's got an engineering degree. He's what I call an intellect. He's uh, breaks things a little bit more official. He knows the science behind stuff more. Whereas I'm a little bit more myth bustery, jackass, and Saturday Night Live all rolled into one. And so basically, he doesn't like me. Um, it takes a while for intellects to, to get used to me. They never do quite like me trying to appeal to that audience, right? And so they've always dominated the educational space. And then I come along break two carabiners and go oh microfractures are a myth and it's like well yes microfractures exist it's just i was always taught that when you drop a carabiner you should retire it and that's bullshit now of course that's becoming common knowledge but it wasn't when i started climbing i just know like that video would be super interesting to watch if i were looking for this channel you know and shock loading Shock loading's hilarious. If you have anything long and dynamic in the system, who cares if the anchor shifts two feet as long as it's still padded? Um, it's just, it's funny how dogmatic people get over things that really aren't that big of a deal. Um, there are things that are a big deal, but I think, I don't know if it's an insecurity thing or a lack of knowledge or just an overinflated ego. People get really picky about certain things that have like they just think it's um like bolts 
oh my god, if you don't clean the hole perfectly, oh my god, we should just shit on anybody who doesn't bolt perfectly. And so there's so much ism around bolts that I called it the bolting Bible because people act like they used to in church when you brought up whether or not puppies and babies went to heaven. Like it just, and they would just be so like, no, they don't. And it's like, first of all, does it matter? So, um, yes, it matters. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my God. And so people act like that about bolts. So I basically shit on everybody by calling it the bolting Bible. Um, and putting a ton of innuendos in there because I wanted to make people uh, just cringe it like all right so I have the best knowledge on the internet about bolts now and yeah you know, you're gonna have to take it you know the way I give it to you it's a free book after all um so Yosemite uh, Rafa asks here about Yosemite um and how they respond to other people making videos so let's let's use free solo as the biggest video I don't know if they got permits. It's kind of a forgiveness, ask for forgiveness, not permission. And that is, um, you, you can get in trouble, right? And especially because I keep going back there. Um, I, I have to just tread lightly and have to respect the fact that Yosemite makes rules. Like I'm also the guy that tipped over the, the line when I rigged Bernal Falls in 2016, um, it was the weekend Obama came to the Valley, which, I mean, we didn't know that. And then it got too much attention. Plus it was a really cool line. It was the first project that it got recognition from the community of just like, it was a cool project. It was like, every everybody does a project where it's like, they feel like they've made it. And it's like, you graduated. And it's just this self-graduating concept. And that was that line. And then the waterfalls became illegal after that. But that's because Upper Yosemite Falls was rigged like 30 times every weekend, in a, like in a row. And so they were just done with us being all in the way all the time. But um, if I do the Dan Osmond rope jump again, uh, if I repeat that jump, it's a 300 meter jump by 300 meter long, you know, horizontal. Uh, super classic rope jump. Um, they might make rope jumping illegal when I'm done. You know, I'm going to make a video about it. I'm going to try to downplay it and not be like, oh, maybe we're going to die. Who knows? But if I don't do that and I just do it as like a tribute to Dan Osmond, they might not be such, you know, so weird about it. Um, but let's see, Yosemite. So anyways, so right now I try to do about half videos for climbers and half videos for highliners and i'm going to release the highlining 101 videos that i've done on how to use a highline that's already rigged because i made um less funny videos but like more like tutorial type which is not my style i usually have a storyline and jokes in there and i'm going to actually release those videos on my main youtube channel instead of it just being buried inside of a highline course um basically is they they've got like 38 views it's just not it's just buried inside of a google doc buried in my website it's like this stuff people want to see sam um sam put out a video on how to climb a leash and it has 40,000 views like i have three videos like that one with no views so i'm trying to put highlining university videos on the internet um you know, I'm trying to be a businessman, right? I'm trying to like, you know, I helped start Juno and I have this painting business. And so I, I want to uh, try to make YouTube sustainable. So I try to make, you know, capture your audience, take them to your web, funnel them through, get their email and get them to the shopping cart and get their credit card, right? That's the business model for YouTube. Well, I'm like, well, I never did this for the money. And so whenever I try and, and, and steer away from the goal of, making everything available about highlining in one place super thorough with real facts I, whenever i leave that goal it bites me in the ass i had two people buy the course it took me a year to bake, make it so i'm like i'd rather have the views than 100 bucks and so and like one one out of every 10 people that takes the course you know spot us 20 bucks campaign um people do help the, the idea is that people in other countries 
can who may not be able to afford it um i definitely think any american who 300 meters of webbing could definitely spot me 20 bucks if they've learned everything about highlining for my channel um but if they don't whatever i still help them out and even like i get a lot of favors there's a lot of like social perks um and i've just kind of make the channel as sustainable as possible so you know i, I try not to spend too much money and that's why i can't like progress to the next level because i don't want to juno coffee if i can turn that into a profitable business i would use the profit from that to sponsor projects sponsor athletes donate gear to teams in other countries that can't afford it um and just do a bunch of like be the red bull of 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 coffee that is the goal so that is my attempt to making the channel bigger um back to the, the university so now i'm working on highlining 102 how to rig and i had a writer's block for the longest time because i wanted to um i just want it perfect right i'm in i'm my insecurities all come back out from 2016 of like oh what if i'm wrong and i'm like shit i know a lot i don't know everything but i'll just write down what i do know say what i don't know say things that will you know, explore later to not know something is fine. As long as you're like, yeah, I don't know. But if you act like an expert, even if you are, makes you a dick. Um, and then you're not relatable and there's no room for people to contribute if you act like you know everything. So that's why I, I almost act like I know less than I really do, which just gets the trolls going, right? And they're like, you should know more before teaching people this stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, I've done way more research than I've let on. Like, how do you think I pulled off this stunt? I'm like, oh, I wonder if this is gonna work. Like, I'm, I'm acting, guys. I'm a bad actor. This should be pretty obvious. Um, anyways, the, the Highline courses are now gonna be like the Bolting Bible, which is basically, um, a theme so in, in the highland university it's it's school themed with like the humor is just salty um kind of like sarcasm whereas the bolting bible is innuendos just because bolts have like so much opportunity for innuendos and um basically it's gonna have rope jumping courses and space nets because i had somebody message me i think last night about how to how to build a space net or how to like build a tree net or something I'm like oh my gosh first of all i have videos about this second of all they're kind of hard to piece together like start to finish how to build a net you know if you don't know anything but i mean when people give me those questions i'd be able to refer them to the courses which has not just my information but everyone's so because if somebody doesn't agree with something and there's two schools of thought and you can't resolve it with a break test you would, I would just put both schools of thought in, in the course and why those two thoughts exist. It's not to teach people what to think, it's to teach them how to think. And that's a little bit different than a lot of courses out, especially for climbing courses, is they're like, this is how you build an anchor. You just you use uh, equalized and reduce shock loading and five to one safety ratios. I'm like, you can break all those rules. We're just gonna teach you like, why they exist, why you should do them, how to break them if you're gonna break them, and don't do something sketchy unless it's intentional and has a reason. Um, you don't wanna die because you're an idiot. So my personal rigging goals, which you can see maybe in kind of how the videos, what I focus on, is to, um, I've done projects in a day. So I've done Lost Arrow Spire by myself in a day. And that's usually like, you know, three people go up for three days typically is kind of, that's the kind of project to make it worth going. Um, Half Dome is kind of the same thing. It's a, it's a, it's a project, mostly because the hike is so big. I want to do Half Dome and Lost Arrow Spire in a day by myself. I'll probably do it with Andy or somebody first, um, just because it'll be a little bit easier if I did that. And then I would uh, try to repeat it by myself. And so you're, it takes about 24 hours, so you get 12 hours for each project, which is very doable by themselves, as long as you don't make any mistakes. Um, so in that situation, I might highline without a backup. 
uh, because I'm only going to highlight it once. I'll pat it well, and I can't carry much. i am got to go ultra, ultra light. So rules like that, I, I try to learn what rules I can break in order to um, be able to do stuff like that. So no rules like a pro, so you can break them like an artist. I like that phrase. Anyways, my ultimate goal is to rig a one mile long high line by myself in a day with no sponsor, with all my own webbing, all my own gear. Because I don't think any projects have been rigged that big in a team without having some slackline company um, sponsor it or donate the webbing or something. It's always been kind of out of reach. And so I've just collected the webbing over time. Uh, the segmented thing obviously is the key to that. Uh, I have to learn winches a little bit better because I would want to use a winch. But you have to, how do you, you know, keep the tag, how do you keep the webbing off the ground and not drag it across whatever canyon you're doing um, and not damage it? So there's just lots of logistics I still have to work out. Um, and so the mile long project by myself in a day. But I also do, I like to do silly stunts. I think stunts are a form of art that I like to do. That's why I think I really connect with Andy so well, because he'll do, you know, really stupid things like tie a leash around his nuts. So I just stick something in my ass and walk into that, you know, and it's like, it's, it's really funny to uh, d do dangerous things for no other reason than to be funny. Um, another thing I'm going to do is an all natural highline. Um, all natural like and then I'm gonna make fun of all the uh, plastic walkers out there so I do have hemp webbing I have a wood lock I made an entire web lock out of two by sixes and closet poles uh, and glued it together the glue is technically not organic but, yeah. but anyways um, it's all gonna be renewable resource stuff and I have a um, manila rope and I'm gonna use knots for uh, like in cracks and then wrap a tree and just do all sorts of things for the um, all natural rig. But it's it's extremely dangerous because um, the hemp webbing breaks at four kilonewtons. So it's basically a no whip line. Now I think the manila rope might be the thing that actually saves me if, if it were to break. So um, I test it first. I use like real backups and see if, you know, what the limits are. Um, but we'll see, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how soon that comes about because I'm going to probably practice that in, um, over water first. And like, I probably would film it and intentionally show that it breaks and show that it's dangerous. And then like, Oh, I don't know. This isn't working really well, but we should highlight anyways. But then like, I, I don't want people to think like, that's how you do stunts because then you'll just die. It's just, it's all a mirage. So there is technically, I found a corn webbing or made out of mace fibers. That's technically all natural. That might be my solution. Um, but um, yeah, I always got something up my sleeve. The other stuff I got up my sleeve right now is the book of Slack has a lot of Slack religious stuff because it was the Bible for the church of Slack life. There's actually like 80% of it's super good. The history, flow state, things like that. So I'm actually gonna re brand that into make different covers for them take out the slack religious stuff and um and kind of make them into like smaller books into specific things that people want to to read right i'll probably keep the religious stuff at the beginning um from the beginning i'll keep it like as a separate thing and put in like the archives if you go to the very 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 bottom of the home page um, there's very, 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 very small font. If you click on that font, it's got some good stuff in there. And that's where I'll house probably the church, um, the church stuff. And I'll probably write a little short blog, a blog about what I learned from starting a religion. So that'll be all in that super, super tiny link, um, that only if you're a deserving audience, can you even find it? Um, anyways. What else do I have up my sleeve? So the Highline University is obviously a big one. In the Bolting Bible, all these courses I update every year, right? So in theory, I can just write really quickly the Highlining 102, 103, 104. I can write all those and just have version one out and done. And that way, 
uh, just updated each year because I'll get a lot of the feedback really helps and then people um, like Dan Walsh is gonna write and a whole thing about access how to get access and um, how not to get access because he does that's what he focuses on in slackline us and um, if he's not done with it I can still put out version one right but the bolting Bible I, what's really cool is I want to add about caving bolts the bolting history bolts you might see on rocks because obviously we don't promote using carrots or um, other rivets or we're just drop in anchors like things that you'll see out on the rock and it'd be nice to be able to identify name that bolt um, I want to write the book of the dead in the bolting Bible of people that died specifically because the bolts failed and that is something I um, it, it's just like I don't know people treat death differently but I think it's really important to stare at it directly the issues and analyze not analyze like the bolt failed it's just like this is why we just get super picky about the bolts because people die if you don't do them right and um, and the other part is like indoor bolts like how strong are those gym bolts what happens when you pull on a gym bolt uh, it'd be kind of fun to know what the forces are it'd be fun to see a gym wall explode and uh, and how T nuts work and stuff. Like, it's nice to know what you're clipping to if you're trusting your life to it. And then caving. We're going to do uh, bolts specifically for caving and what people look for. It's about this, it's, they're like the kind, same kind of bolts, but um, just there's different considerations when you're using um, bolts for caves. And because we really do want to have literally everything on, on bolts and climbing bolts. And, um, um, and Tovino asks, how long does it paint a house? Um, well, it depends on the house. When you're done, that's when you're done. Um, to, on this project, we are painting a Victorian house. And this is a very large project. And it has six colors and a lot of scraping. And that is, uh, it's, gonna, it's like a two week project. Um, two and a half weeks. I am painting a hotel in Berkeley, California next week. And that's like a 30 to 40 day project. But most projects I do take anywhere from two to five days. Um, and so ideally most of those jobs are in Lodi in the town I live. And that helps me get home at a reasonable hour so I can work on my channel. My entire business model is built around having, well I have extra help here right now, but one employee, keeping things small, turning down a lot of jobs, turned down a lot of money in order to maintain doing the channel. And um, anyway, so the course is, I wanna dive into how webbing is weaved, into like go to a Dyneema factory and watch how Dyneema is made because Dyneema is different. There's like summer Vectrin, I think, or Technora is melted. Um, Dyneema is gelled. It's just like, there. it's just interesting how all these different threads are made. And I actually got some 12 braid Technora and 12 braid Vectrin, which I'm stoked because they have much, much higher melting points and abrasion resistance. Soft shackles have always been made out of uh, Dyneema because it floats in water and it was a sailor's tool and we just adopted what already existed and repurposed it and now winch um the winch industry and towing industry uses soft shackles as well however if we're worried about segmented high lines and having the two interact with each other on a windy high line i still don't think melting's an issue you're still talking about it the hottest point of a repel, you know, when you can't touch your repel device anymore, still will not melt Dyneema. However, if people are worried about it. It'd be fun to explore making soft shackles out of Vectrin and Technora. And uh, it just is the next progression, I think, as an option for highlighting. It's a little niche. I don't know if it's really going to take off. But uh, someone's asking here what the, my opinion of the future growth of slackline and highlining is. Um, I think, I don't think we're in the seventies of climbing anymore. In the seventies of climbing, everything was just 
sandbag and badasses and hardcore and in innovation and black diamond was born and just like all this stuff like new great stuff was happening all the time i don't see new great stuff happening as often it still does but i feel like we're in the 90s of climbing with the internet sharing information and hopefully with me being able to homogenize everybody's information into one thing um it's going to accelerate what we can do in the sport it was interesting at the two kilometer long highline in asbestos last year how much how often people talked about how they would rather rig a, a beautiful hundred meter and play on that than try to rig a three kilometer long high line like people are kind of over the deck measuring contest of it's super inspiring it's super neat but at the same time um there's there, there's a point where it's a lot of work you have to have a whole team to do it you have to have somebody on the far side all the time to just look at the anchor or to have rescue plans that don't even really work um it's a lot of money wind is a huge issue it's just not even like you, you're talking about three hour cues and then so it's, i don't see long highlining being that popular other than you're new you're not new anymore and you want to try doing what you've seen on the internet more than more than you want i don't know like we're gonna rig a five so i i don't i'm not gonna cross it I want to go out about 100 meters on it and come back. I don't want to be on a high line that long. <laughs> but the rigging aspect is fascinating. Because, like, we were going to do the shower cushion method, but nobody has a tagline long enough because you can't have a knot in the middle of your shower curtain line to hold the weight up of the other webbing. So, the thing that fascinates me about big lines is the rigging. But as far as the sport goes, I think the trick high lining has really given an avenue for people to do lines that are like 200 meters or less uh which i consider 200 meters or less to be short lines uh the biggest crux we're going to have is, a, is access you can only rig in so many places logistically and then half of those places are kind of illegal Half those places go over roads, and half those places are popular for other people. And unless this sport becomes mainstream to where the general public knows what they're looking at, knows that it's safe, and accepts it, um, we're going to just have a difficult time being able to have a location to put these things. Here in a, a local area in California, we've got, I guess, a 300 and a 200 meter up right now. And they just they leave it up it's just one of the few places they're always leaving lines up um they use bike locks to lock the leash to the anchor and so you have to know the code in order to highline on them which is really clever but like if that area got shut down like where would they where would we rig a big line you know so um yosemite's limited you know can't leave it line up overnight technically and if you do you have to babysit it but you can't camp there so you can't babysit it it's just really stupid so access is going to be a huge thing about um growing the sport but slacklining most people have heard of what slacklining is now um so that helps and i think i think china is going to start making knockoffs of highline gear at least popular stuff maybe not niche highline gear and that is hopefully something that doesn't really take off. Um, so especially the webbing, like a lot of manufacturers do get their webbing from a China manufacturer, but just like Chinese knockoffs need to be like um, shunned in this sport, uh, the best to our ability. I mean, we already have like so many ridiculous brands for ratchet kits because like everybody with a with an eight-year-old buys them now so but i mean as kids grow up with this stuff holy cow like they're gonna grow up and they're gonna want to highlight it's gonna be really interesting um as climbing gyms maybe a lot permanently rigged in their place in their space it's going to bring a lot more attention to it 
And I'm doing this channel, well, especially in 2016, I did this channel knowing it was a small sport and that it will get bigger. And so just by natural inflation of the sport, the, the channel will grow. And that's why I really want the information to be out there when an enormous amount of people flood the market because like you really kind of do have to screw up pretty bad on a high line in order to die like they're pretty safe but it's also really not good for the sport as a whole if people die doing what we're doing because it's not necessary and then oh my god when people die everyone freaks out even though climbers die all the time i think that's an accepted risk of what they do but um yeah so let's see yeah i i am curious if any of you guys watching now or later after this video is uploaded to the channel if um you'd be interested in helping with uh looking over the highline course the highline 102 is available on the website now it's just like has half the chapters done so you can kind of see the work in progress. If you want to write a section, it would be helpful. Um, if you know anything, if you have a specialty knowledge about something, it's super helpful if you um, contribute like a weekend to putting what you know into the pot. And I'm like a hoarder of information and I like organizing things like, like like the same way people like doing puzzles. I joke that I'm the Robin Hood of information. I take information from uh, smart people and I hand it out to dumb people because I too am dumb. And, you know, I think information be, should be spread evenly across all everyone. <laughs> Don't quite feel that way about money, but uh, <laughs> definitely feel that way about information. So um, I don't charge for anything on the website because um, people are more likely to help if things are free and um, I want everyone to learn about bolts for example more than I want 20 bucks it's gonna benefit the bolting world it's gonna benefit our crags it's gonna benefit our high lines if people know what they're doing a lot of people spend a lot of their own money replacing bolts um, on their own dime and all the work that goes into it my version is just a lot more scalable because I, you know, near San Francisco and scalable is just the culture around here. And so these, what I would call the equivalent effort of what I do is just to help empower um, everyone else and in, in order to make good decisions when they go bolt. Because when I was super stoked on bolting, I was putting in zinc plated stuff and I've gone back and I've already seen corrosion start on them. It's not like they're gonna kill you today, but like, I want them to last more than 10 or 20 years. I want them to last my whole life. There's no reason that someone else needs to go replace them in 20 years just because I put in something wrong. Same with highlining. Um, it's nice when everyone gets the same starting point that you don't have all this um, advantage because you live in a first world country. Um, there's like a there's like a slack privilege that goes on with countries that have a lot of highliners and then where there's not a big community people are just kind of like left to learn on their own it's like they get to start in 2005 all on their own and they can't progress like like we are because we have this huge foundation and i i would love to level out the playing field i think there's amazing talent out there if people had the same starting point. So we'll, and a lot of neat ideas come out of places. And so I'm excited to um, homogenize all the information for free. Um, it also is, was always my goal. And um, let's see, things are, so people ask me often about if I'm gonna publish a book Oh, am I still there? It's, I think we're getting to see. Um, okay, I'm back. So people ask me often if I'm going to publish a book or publish the Bolting Bible as a book. Oh, I know it's getting spotty. 
Um, so, anyways, I'll finish this, and then we'll end here. Um, people ask me if I'm going to publish, print, the Bolting Bible. And part of me, the ego part of me, wants to say yes, because I want to say that I published a book. But um, whenever I let my ego get in the way, it hinders me from the goal. And I want to make sure that um, everyone can read it. And a PDF online for free is the only way to do that. If you print it, only a few people are going to buy it. And it's only going to be in, basically in my situation, um, in the United States. And I mean, it's nice to be able to hold a book and it's nice to be able to say I printed a book or publish a book, but it also costs, I mean, something with photos on every page costs, it cost me $80 a book to print it. And so um, it's not practical to print things anymore. It's not practical to um, not have information for free. Like a lot of places they'll, I, I'm watching a lot of these climbing tutorial just on how they do it. One, they're boring. Two, they charge quite a bit. And it's like, why? Why not get money on the back end? Like the social benefits of what I do are just really valuable. Um, I, I will still pay for some slackline gear. I'll pay to go to festivals if I'm not volunteering. I don't I don't try to just like mooch just because like, oh, I'm on YouTube. But I, I definitely, um, people just do a lot of things for me. It's really cool. Like I get to, um, I get to meet people all around the world. Sometimes they'll pick me up from the airport, get to stay at their house. They get to show me their highline areas. I get to explore the whole world in such a neat way because they saw me on the internet. It's like, it's, it's fun for me. So um, there's going to be um, a description in the, or there's going to be a link in the description below for um, the video. Um, just check out the description. Um, Kat's in charge of this. Kat's been really great about managing all the people on here and for the lockdown series. Um, it's a lot of work for her to manage the people, coordinate with them, teach me how to use the program that's even doing this. Um, I don't think people realize how much work it takes to do anything until they've done it. Um, so it, it's nice to uh, be gentle in comments. If you ever you know, leave a comment to someone about their videos or stuff. I'm I'm a little thicker skin than I used to be, but I'll watch somebody put in a lot of effort on sharing some tutorial, and then I'll watch trolls eat them up or criticize, and I watch them disappear after that. Um, it was interesting. Um, Charles, uh, Charles, I forget his last name. Charles in Europe. Um, he he had great information. I took one of his classes at the uh, Lublin Highline Festival and it was, I was like, wow, you're, you're really good at teaching. You know a lot. And he told me that he stopped because of trolls. Um, this was years ago. I don't know if he feels the same way today, but it was just really stuck with me that we lost a good source because of it. So, you don't have to agree with everything somebody puts on the internet. I'm definitely not saying that, but um, we can definitely do it in a nicer way. People read comments, you know, so it's it's important to uh, remember that it takes a lot of work to put out uh, anything. And so, I mean, this uh, the lockdown series is is a huge amount of work, and so is um, all the ISA does. It takes a huge amount, a huge amount of work to create a certified program. And yeah, it's rusty at the beginning because they're winging it. They're like, it's hard to put it together that's sustainable right out the gate, you know? And it's like, they have to charge money for it. They don't have some, some 
bleeding donator that's just infusing them with cash in order to put this. It's not like any of them get paid. Um, so I think the ISA is where I see the most effort put out and the least amount of appreciation for the effort they do. And um, I'm impressed that everyone just keeps going at it. Um, so I... Yeah, I, I kind of am by myself over here in California, sit in a room all the time and with gear behind me and edit videos and put it out and I'm kind of like isolated. Um, and then, but the ISA is definitely more community based. When I was, it was neat to see like, um, it's a really neat group that gets together and, and they do things together. And I can see maybe that's why I'm, <laughs> if they can put in that much effort for that little appreciation because they're like, doing it as a community um if i was only getting 120 views on my videos still i probably wouldn't be doing this so um yeah get involved somehow even if you're new um i mean find find a way to contribute because the more people that contribute to the sport it's gonna just make it better for the next group of people that come in uh, festivals take enormous, enormous amount of work. And I'm not even doing, I'm not going to participate as a volunteer anymore as GGBY because it's, it's stopping me from doing my channel. That net last year killed my Highline courses. I completely put all my Highline courses on the back burner in order to do that net for, and then uh, and then all the other people that run GGBY, I mean, it's just insane the amount of coordinating that takes. And then people bitch about logistics or details or it's like no one gets paid for it. A free ticket. I am so, if GGBY happens this year, I'm so going to buy a ticket and not help. <laughs> but that's the problem. That's the problem with paid festivals you become a consumer. It's like, and I think there's a market for it, but it's like GGBY, what made it special before is there was no consumer attitudes. Everyone contributed. Eh, I mean, there's always the, you know, the, the asshole, but like everyone contributed and that's what made it cool. But as Slackline festivals become more official and you need permits and insurances and somebody in charge. And so then you need to charge for the toilets. And as soon as you charge, you get the consumer mindset. So then you have to provide to the consumer more value. So they come to your festival so you can pay for those toilets and, and you're not even getting a salary. It's just, it's insane. Um, and in order to do my goal of collecting all the information in the world about slacklining and highlining and putting it in one place in a fun, easy to read, easy to watch source. Uh, I can't help, I can barely go to them. If I, go, if I get all my highline courses done this year, I'm going to treat myself to going to like trips next year, which is a lot. I mean, I'm paying business since you know and everything. And it's um, going to be like, my reward for, for working hard is just going and enjoying festivals. I went to the Gravitation Festival last last year, and it was just nice just to show up and just enjoy all the work people put in that and I just got to, I didn't have to rig anything. It was amazing. Uh, I just get to hang out with people. So, but definitely don't um, just be a bum. Um, we do need people to pay for festivals, but it's also nice when people get involved as well. Um, I, I would love to have, if you're an artist, help with adding illustrations to the course, a ghostwriter or a writer with credit, um, more website things that I'm always trying to do. Uh, I, have, I have a lot more stuff than I've even mentioned on here that I'm trying to do. But um, yeah, make sure you uh, go to the website and see what we've done so far. Um, I have put all of the Bolt Buster and Slack Snap videos and charts on there now. So like any break test I've ever done, and I've only published probably 20%. You can, uh, if you go to the website now, and you can follow the folder tree to the sample number and see the break test. 
We just finished 100 hours of work as a team um, putting together an already existing map and an already existing list. It took that much work in order to get the Slackline group map to be basically have everyone on Everyone in the world that has a group is on the Slackline map. And then the, the ISA calendar is on my website now. So anybody who has an event, if I find out anything and it's not on the calendar, I'm going to make sure it gets on there. So literally every Slackline event will be on one calendar if it's not already. And it's just really, really neat to be one group in one unit around the world because there's just not that many of us. Maybe 5,000 Highliners, maybe. Like people who regularly Highline, if I'm generous. So um, it's pretty thinly spread out. So it's nice to feel like you're connected to the family. So go to the website, subscribe on YouTube. It's the only way I really like announce things that are up and coming. I might collect emails and spam people once a month about like the new stuff that I've put out. Um, just because like the groups and the mass, I like post stuff on Instagram, but like not everybody sees every platform. So I might do the email too, which is yet another thing to manage. But um, the Juno coffee I'll bring up. Um, we're, we're taking specialty coffee making it one cup at a time, specialty espresso, and freeze drying it. And what's really neat about that is we can, it's a sustainable, it's a scalable, and it's slack life friendly. So we can um, make a back stock of product, have somebody ship them out if we're out of town, and Nick, who I do this um, Juno business with, we can still go do slack life and and still have a business that is something that can grow something that you can mail hopefully around the world not yet though it's the united states still and um it's just like the perfect business model that's compatible with my youtube channel in my life because i don't want something to take away from my youtube and i want to be able to use my youtube to promote it as well because i don't exactly promote the painting business this is the first time i've ever worn this hat on the youtube um because it's not relevant and so, um, yeah, it just was a puzzle piece that really like connected for me in order to do the instant coffee. Um, and it doesn't taste, it doesn't taste bad at all. It tastes good actually. And which is surprising. We went through a lot of work to make sure instant coffee didn't taste like dirt because that's a reputation it's had in the past. So we're kind of um, excited to break into a, re-break into a, a market that used to be there, but kind of lost traction. And then we're going to um, make instant coffee while paragliding and base jumping and highlining and nets and hammocks and all those like crazy stunts that we do. We're going to make the coffee while we're doing those stunts as um, like try to be the Red Bull of coffee. So that'll be fun to um, have something other than a gear company. You know, like I don't want to make gear. It, this world doesn't need another weblock. Um, it's already hard enough with the... I don't know, five or seven companies that exist now. There's not enough market to be sharing that market share. So um, the last thing I wanted to do was compete with all of my friends and I wanted to stay independent. And um, I think it adds a lot more value to my channel, the fact that I don't make gear and that I can, um, it, I can shit on things if I want. I can say things that I like. You know, it's kind of nice to just not have any skin in the game and to be independent. I think a lot of people appreciate that. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe on the Lockdown series because um, there'll be other cool people saying other cool things down the road. So, thanks for watching. This has been an hour and 15 minutes. Congratulations to anybody who stayed the whole time. So take care and uh, make sure you uh, like my channel as well.